as we know God's desire and desiring for us uh, is to increase and to grow uh, in each of our areas of responsibilities, that we would have greater influence in the world around us. Uh, we like that point, but the, the truth is this, that in order to get there, God needs to prepare us. Uh, and, uh, you know, preparation is not as glamorous uh, as the achievement, right? Uh, if you've been you know, playing any sport, if you, you know, in, in the past had to uh, train with a particular sporting team, uh, you know that doing the drills is not as fun as scoring the goals in a competition, right? But it is, is, it is in the practice of the doing of the drills that it prepares you for the competition and the success that can happen. Uh, in the working environment, you know that that takes a certain amount of discipline uh, to be a good performer every day. Whether your boss sees, whether your supervisor understands or not, you are diligent in the work that you do. And it's in that preparation that you get the promotion and you get the uh, achievement and the successes of what we want. And so uh, the theme for this entire series has been really that God wants to launch us into good things, into new things, uh, into greater things even. But in order to launch us, God wants to get us ready. Uh, and so I invite us to put a lens uh, on our lives and on this year. And that lens is that God is preparing us. God is preparing us. You know, uh, Jesus said this in the, uh, and Luke is, uh, sort of got it for us uh, in his gospel in Luke chapter 16. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Now, I know some of you are saying, you know, God, I've been with very little for a long time. How about trusting me with some much, lah? you know? Uh, but the reality is this, with whatever is in our hands, whatever the scope of your responsibility, whatever authority that you have in your life right now, what you do with it matters because God says this, when your heart attitude is right with the little, then you are ready for more, right? And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And we don't like this part of the, the text. We don't like this part of the verse because we always believe this. We believe if God gave me more money, I will be more generous, right? Not true. God is looking for what we do, whether we have a generosity with the little first. And in that, we demonstrate that we truly trust the Lord uh, in whether we have much or whether we have a little. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? You know what the text is telling us? It's telling us this, how we respond to the material, physical things in our world. What you do with the phone that you have and the job that you have and the gifts that you have and the uh, opportunities that you have is going to be an indication of whether God's going to bring greater revelation for spiritual truth in our lives as well. You know, and so there's true riches that God wants to release to us. And in order to do that, God says, what are you going to do with what's in your hand? So this has been the overarching thought for us through this whole series, that God prepares those he promotes. Would you say it on the count of three? And if you're watching online, would you type this in the chat? God prepares those he promotes. On the count of three, one, two, three. God prepares those he promotes. And so we want the promotion, but I came today to say, let's focus on the preparation. Because if you let God prepare you, then you and I can get ready for whenever he releases us to the next level of promotion. Now, how does God prepare us? Many ways, but one of the ways in which God is preparing us is through tests. And we don't like tests, right? We don't like to study for tests. We don't like what tests demand of us. But tests are really important because they give us feedback. So many years ago, I used to be a teacher in a school. I loved it, enjoyed every moment of it, uh, enjoyed being in the classroom. And I remember this one sort of incident. A student came to me. His name is Stephen. And Stephen comes to me. And this was after I had returned a test result. And he comes to me. He says, he used to call me Cher, right? You know, because short for teacher, because teacher is just way too demanding to say, uh, or, you know, they call him Mr. Wicks, right? Uh, so this, Stephen comes to me and goes, Cher, can you give me an uh, extra mark? So I said, I can't just give you marks freely. He said, please, Cher, please, please, please just, just, just give me extra mark. Then give me extra mark, then I can get a different grade. I said, if you got the right answer, I can give you the extra mark. He said, please, Cher, please, please, Cher. I said, I can't give you the, please, half mark, Cher, please, please, Cher, please, just give me half mark, please, Cher, just, just, just half mark, just half mark, just give me, give me. So then as he was kind of just going on and on and on, suddenly I should just turn to him and said, please, Stephen, please, Stephen, you just study harder. La. You study harder. If you study harder, then I can give you the mark. You know, then if you study harder, everything will be okay. He just looked at me stunned. And then he walked off. 
And you see, what I realized in that interaction was this, that Stephen totally missed the point of the test. He was solely focused on the grade and the mark. And he just wanted another mark because he wanted to feel, okay, he got a better grade. But he missed what the test was about. The purpose of the test was so that he would get feedback on what he understood and what he did not understand. As we think of 2020, as we think of our lives even right now, and we, maybe some of you would say, you know, I recognize I'm going through a test. But I want to invite you, don't just hope to get through the test and just make it, just pass. You know, many of us, maybe as we think of ourselves in 2021, we think, you know, thank God we got through 2020. But if 2020 was a test, it's not just that we got to 2021. It's not just that we passed. But what was the feedback that God was giving us through the test of 2020? That's the key. That's important. Did God show you that your faith was strong, that your confidence with Him is true? Or, or did God start to show you actually there's a deep fear that you still have this, this, this uh, sense of insecurity inside of you? What did that isolation do for you? Did you suddenly realize, actually, I have been trying to live my life on my own and I don't have support. I don't have a community that I can journey with. You see, in every test, Test as feedback, and it's that feedback that becomes really important because then we are growing because of the testing. We are growing because of the preparations. And so we've been looking at three tests uh, that we go through, uh, and sometimes God allows us to go through. Uh, and so if you've missed any, any one of that, you can go back uh, and watch it uh, on YouTube. And so today we've come down to the last test that I want to share with you that I feel um, is perhaps the most important for us as Singaporeans, but also sometimes the hardest test uh, to see. Uh, we've been looking at the life of David, uh, and through the journey of David's life, uh, we see unpacked in his journey, in his preparation of how God allowed a variety of tests to happen for him and through him. And in that, we learn what we can do as we respond uh, to the tests in our lives. Uh, and so we're going to pick the story up uh, about David uh, as we try and unpack this last test. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, so Saul was the king, and Saul sent David on various missions. David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. So right there is the, is, encapsulates our hope and our dream, right? We all hope that we would be so successful that we would get a high rank, right? Ultimately, that's where we're at and what we're looking for, that we would be so successful in order to get a high rank. And so today, the test that I want us to reflect over is the test of success. Now, some of you are saying, Rodden, isn't the goal success? Isn't the reward the success? You mean there's also a test in success? Absolutely. In fact, I would say it is a much more subtler a test for us than the pain that we experience. In success, we tend to be uh, blinded. We tend to not be responsive to God as much as when we find ourselves in pain. You know, and so it's really important for us to understand, even when we are successful, that there is a test. You know, one way you can think about it is, is like this. There's always a testing before the blessing. But in the blessing is also a testing. And that's something key for us to remember, that whenever you find yourself getting that new promotion, getting a bit of abundance, getting more influence, getting greater authority, whenever you find yourself in a place of success, you feel, okay, I've achieved something. There is a test that comes with that. You know, it's, it's, we live in a world today where we are pursuing success. And don't get me wrong, success is important. And we'll talk about why it is important. God does want you to prosper. God does want me uh, to get to a greater platform so we have greater influence with the people around us. But when we think of success, so often we've got story after story after story of successful people whose lives completely went to pots, whose lives completely became destructive and broken. There's so many stories of people like that. Why? Because we think the goal is success and we don't allow God to continue to prepare us for that success. C.S. Lewis uh, said this. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts in our pains. And I think the point of the quote was to remind us that in our pain, in our brokenness, God is trying to get our attention. But my experience has been this. 
my experience has been that this quote is absolutely true. That when people go through painful, difficult circumstances, when people find themselves in broken situations, you know, their response is, I want to know what God has to say. You know, I've had many people come to me and say, Rodin, you know what, I, I, I need a job. Can you start praying for me and pray that God would open a job for me? And I pray. But I've also noticed that when these people get the job, they stop coming for prayer. It's interesting, right? When we are in the exam period, we study, 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 but we're also very holy. We pray, pray, pray. Then we finish the exam and then suddenly holiness disappears. Right? We just go and party. <laughs> And then when the results are coming, oh, then we pray, 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 pray. Then we get the results and we like, okay, however. Isn't it interesting? Human nature behaves like this all the time in our circumstances. And so when there's pain and when there's difficulty and with, uh, when there's brokenness, it often drives us to God. And that's a good thing. But what C.S. Lewis is saying is this, and even though it's not the major point of his quote, it's such an important thing. He's saying this, but in our success, in our pleasure, there is also a whisper. It's not a shout. But there is a whisper, and in that whisper, we don't hear that whisper. We miss what the success is also going to be about. Therefore, even when we are successful, there is more that we need to be careful about. When you have achieved, when you've done well, and that's good. And that's what we should need to pursue and become, because I think it's built in all of us. You know what? I, I used to play sport. I know maybe looking at me today, you think, really, man? Uh, I used to play sport many, many years ago. And I tell you this, winning is everything. And the will to want to win is, it's wonderful when you beat an opponent and you worked hard as a team and you see the success. And so this drive is natural and it's God-given. It's a good thing. But oftentimes what happens is this, we get lost in our success. So here's one of those things that happens in our success. Whatever mission, uh, we're looking at, at David's life. Whatever mission Saul sent him on just now, we read, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. You know, his success caused people to be pleased with him in what he was doing. Right after he fights with Goliath, uh, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing in joyful songs with timbrels and lyres. Basically, as he came back victorious, there were songs being sung about him. And here's something we need to be aware of and careful. That success really invites popularity. It's a natural thing. When you are successful, you suddenly find that people who want to come to you. People want to find out things about you. People want to get, gather around you. And there are two ideas when it comes to popularity. One has to do with the notion of uh, you know, being likable. And so we find ourselves living in a world where we want to be likable. The more people who can like us, the better we feel about ourselves. Now, when and this sort of uh, came from a study, from uh, a psychological study, that when children are young, their likability is, is deep and desired. And so what happens for them when, at that age is they actually try and help people in order to be likable. So there is a positive trait that comes out of the likability. But as they grow up, the likability and the sense of popularity changes to that of desiring status. So they want to be popular in order to have status. And we live in a very, very interesting, interesting time in the world right now. Because today, you can be popular for just being popular. Do you realize? You don't actually have to do anything. You can just become popular. And so the young people today who want to just become influencers, they just want to become popular on YouTube in order to just be popular for being popular sake. Right? And so popularity has a draw to it because it gives us the sense that we have a status among other people. So people listen to you, people want to know your opinion, people uh, you know, uh, want to get around you, people want to help you with things. But the danger of popularity is this. The danger of popularity is that it blinds us. And fundamentally, it blinds us to the truth of who we are. Our sense of reality gets warped very easily. And so we think we are better than we really are. Because at the, at the heart of this desire for popularity is pride. And pride, if you think of it, is really very, very close to sin. Because as we act out in pride, at the center of pride is the letter I. At the center of sin is the letter I. 
And so the center of our lives is this, as we start to think when it's all about me, we lose a sense of reality. We lose a sense of balance in our world. You know, I, I'm sure you've experienced this as well. You know, like you, you meet somebody who's successful. Maybe this is a successful person in finance, right? So this person knows how to create wealth, has kind of done well with finance. But somehow, even though they're really good at finance, suddenly they also think that they are an expert in every other area. We get blinded by our popularity and by our success. And so we need to be careful with this. You see, when the light that shines through us gets dimmed by the light that shines upon us, we've missed what it's all about. You see, success will cause us to have this warped sense of what's right or wrong. And we need to be careful whenever we find ourselves in abundance. Uh, this is uh, a proverb that's written. And in this proverb, it speaks about the praises of people. The crucible for silver... And so you heat the, uh, the crucible up, uh, the furnace for gold. And so this is a refining process. But a man is tested by the praise he receives. You know, it's not bad to get praise. And so this is also really key. After this, don't walk away because, you know, Asian now we like this. Uh, cannot praise. Uh, we praise and then it goes to their head. No, we need to encourage. We need to praise. We need to honor. We need to be, uh, you know, lavish in our belief in one another and in our speaking of that encouragement to one another. Because without encouragement, we don't thrive. But we've got to be careful when we hear that encouragement, when we hear those words, that we are in those moments understanding that God is testing us. God is refining us. How you respond to the praises of people around you, how you respond to success and popularity will make a significant difference to the rest of your life. It can cause you to flourish and continue to flourish or it can cause us to really take a downhill dive. A simple way to think about it is to think about it like chewing gum. Whether criticisms or compliments, chew on it a little bit then spit it out. If you swallow it, it will choke you to death. We've been looking at David and David shows us that popularity is a dangerous thing. The next thing I want to look at has to do with, uh, we're going to look at two episodes and then kind of figure out what do we do with success. The next kind of episode in David's life is really comes out of 2 Samuel. And in it, you see David absolutely victorious. So in 2 Samuel chapter 8, he conquers the Moabites. So these were enemies. In 2 Samuel chapter uh, 9, sorry, he overcomes the Edomites as well, right? So he conquers the Edomites. And so much so that you listen to this uh, particular uh, passage about him. It says, and David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites. And so it's true. Your success will make you famous. Now, God doesn't say be afraid of fame. No. God doesn't say reject fame. No. It has to do with a heart attitude. It has to do with a response of our lives. And so you need to know every time that success, there's achievement, those good things will lead you to a place of victory, will also lead you to, be, uh, to a place of uh, becoming famous. Uh, and then in, in uh, chapter 9, you see David's kindness towards Jonathan's son. And so what we have in these chapters is you have David victorious, David being kind and generous to other people who need him. And then in chapter 10, you have him being victorious over the Ammonites. What am I doing is this. I'm saying David was successful, 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 and he was a good person. You see this over and over again in those chapters. And so we have 8, 9, and 10 reflecting to us David who was absolutely successful. You know what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 11? In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out uh, with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, many of you would be familiar with this, and if you're not, what's about to happen is this. David is about to see Bathsheba, and he's about to engage both in adultery and in murder. Can you see this pattern, why it's important for us to pay attention to our success? Victory, 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 and then this moment. What happened? What happened? Why is it suddenly David's life turns? Because here's the second thought. Success breeds complacency. 
When you do well, you suddenly think the reason I'm doing well is because I am great. I am good. And in that complacency we see in David's world, he should have been going out to war, but he doesn't. He lets the army go out to war and he remains behind. And that becomes the trigger and the situational trigger that causes the rest of his journey to end up in sin and in brokenness. But here's the thing. So often we can find ourselves succeeding and doing well, and we continue to be driven in the work environment or in the sport environment or in the educational environment. But every time we succeed, what starts to shift is a moral complacency. David was winning battles with enemies outside, but lost the battle with the enemy in his heart. And that's what we need to be most careful about. As we find ourselves saying, God, we want more, we also need to allow the Lord to shift the condition of our hearts on the inside. So the question is this, right? We all desire success, and I'm saying success is good, and God wants us to experience success. But what then should we do with success? How do we respond to the success that God can grant us and give to us? And here's the third scenario. So this happens from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. During the harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam while a band of Philistines were, was encamped in the Valley of Rephaim. So there are two locations the Bible tells us. One is where David is. He's in the cave of Adullam. So where is the cave? The cave is in a place called Adullam, right? So that's his location. And then the Philistines, who are their enemy, is now in a place called Raphaim, in the Valley of Raphaim. I'm going to throw a map up, and if you're watching online, you'll also have this map. And this map will show us these locations because it's quite key for us to understand what's going on in this text by knowing and understanding the geography of the situation. So right in the middle, that's Adullam, right? But where the enemy is, is this place called Raphaim, which is in the valley just around Bethlehem. Bethlehem was David's hometown. That's where he was born. That's where his, his family is. And where David is believing God is sending him to is Jerusalem. That is the place that he wants to build his kingdom and build his throne and his headquarters at. So can you see what's going on here? David finds himself now being in a retreat position. And the people who are his enemies seem to be getting to the place that he's hoping to get to. And so in this situation, David makes a thought. He has a sigh almost. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So imagine this moment, right? So David's there, his army is encamped around him. The three these guys from these mighty men sort of come around and David kind of just is musing. Why is he musing? What he says is this. He says, I wish I had some water. The wrong conclusion is to conclude that David was thirsty. The reason that's the long, wrong conclusion is because most of the time, if they had an army encampment, they would not go to a place without a spring nearby because it would be detrimental to the army. So, you know, uh, in, in another part of the text, it says that he had a stronghold, meaning he built a fortress in Adullam. So yes, his headquarters was in this cave, but it was not just a place of nothing. It had a spring nearby. It had sources of food for the, for the army. And so he had preparation for all of these things. It would have not been a case where David was thirsty. So if he's not thirsty, then why does he say, oh, I wish I had a drink of water from Bethlehem? I think this is really what's going on. David is in a place right now where he says, God had promised me this leadership had promised me this success. But why is it we are in a retreat position and the Philistines seem to be closer to Jerusalem? God, where are you? Are you near? Are you still with me? I think David was dejected. I think the army was also a little dejected. What are we going to do? We find ourselves caught far away and yet it seems the enemy is doing better. Have you ever experienced this? Many of us have. Right? You try and do the right thing. You try and do the, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the you know, honorable thing. 
But suddenly, this person gets promoted. And then you think, wow, this person cheat here, do that, all that, but this person also gets promoted. That's kind of maybe the heart of what's going on with David right now. He's saying, you know what? I just long for home. I just long for, you know, something to tell me, God, that you are still with me. And so what happens is this. There are three of these soldiers, and this is an incredible scene. You know, and sometimes when you read the Bible, right, you know, the Bible says things in a mat- very matter-of-fact way, right? Like, but, but if this was a movie, this is a, you know, like it's two hours that would happen between these two lines, you know? So <laughs> there'll be all the drama that happens in between. Right? So sometimes you've got to use your holy imagination and get in the story to kind of figure out what's going on. So these three guys, here's what happens, right? David is just musing. He's not telling them. He's not saying, guys, I want you to go to Bethlehem and get me uh, you know, uh, uh, some water from the well. There's no way David would have done that. That's hubris, right? That's arrogance. That's pride uh, in that. So David would not have done that. But what these guys did was they overheard. They heard the sigh in their master, in their captain. And even that simple sigh, without even giving the instructions, they just knew what his heart was. They said, you know what, we're going to try and do this. This is something that we need to do for the sake of our leader and for the sake of our army and for the sake of what God has been saying to us. So these three guys, what they do is they break through the Philistine lines. What this means is this, that the Philistines had garrisons. And garrisons would be these 20 uh, groups of these 20 uh, army uh, soldiers. And so you'd have multiple garrisons that they would have to break through. So imagine this movie, right? This, this, I mean, this happens in one line, but in reality, this is going to take a lot of amazing, absolute brilliant work. They will have to go in three of them, destroy the 20, destroy the another 20, get past all these garrisons, get to a well in Bethlehem that is already surrounded by soldiers. Two of them will have to fight off the other soldiers. One fuller will have to go and draw the water, put it in that pouch, carry the pouch, and the three of them with this pouch of water fight off this army and get back. All the while, the army must be thinking, what is happening? What are these guys doing? This was not a small feat. This was an incredible moment. This was a moment that was so transformative to what was going to happen to David, to the soldiers, and to the victory later. So they drew the water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. Now think for a moment. You're there, you're the leader, you're dejected, you're wondering, God, where are you? And these guys come back and they say, here's the water. This is Evion. We went to the actual spring and got the actual Evion. Hashtag, by the way, you know Evion backwards is naive? Just saying. (laughs) No product placement here. What would you do if your team came to you and said, here's what we went and sacrificed for? We're going to read what David does. And if you're like me, you're going to get a little confused. So here's what David did. He refused to drink it. I'm like, what's wrong with you, David? These people sacrificed their life. They went there. He, they come back to you. They said, we've risked life for this water because we heard the cry of your heart. We saw the vision that was in your heart. We are going to willingly do whatever we need to do to see that this vision comes to pass. And, pass, and we're here to serve you. We submitted to that authority. And so here's the water. What does David do? He says, I cannot drink this. And then what does he do? He pours it out. Now, maybe you've read this story before and you've heard this, uh, the, the, this text before. And I've always struggled with it because it's so weird. Like, what is he doing? How come? I mean, the least you can do is drink it. Right? You know, if somebody gives you, you know, like, um, I, I do not like durian. Okay, let's just make that publicly known. Right? I do not like durian. Those of you who eat durian, we will have a prayer time for you. Uh, after the service, you know, those of you online, we will make sure that you receive Jesus and be redeemed uh, from the sin of Duran. There is no such thing as the sin of Duran, just in case. Uh, but I do not like Duran, right? Um, but um, uh, once uh, one, one of my colleagues got me uh, a Duran, well, chocolate covered Duran, because she did not know that I did not like Duran. Uh, and she gave me this box of chocolate. Now, what do you think I did when she gave me this box of chocolate? I opened it, I said, thank you very much, and I ate the durian chocolate. The love that was in my heart. 
So what is David doing, even though these people had sacrificed, and yet he pours it on the ground? Wouldn't you be insulted? If you sacrificed, you did kind of everything, and you kind of came and said, okay, here, here, you know, I sacrifice. I serve on the worship team, week in, week out. You know, I serve as an usher. I do a life leader. I, you know, um, uh, discipling other people. And then it seems that the response of the leadership is we pour it out. What is happening? And this is, I think, the key to how we should respond to success. Because what happened was this. These mighty men, these three guys were incredibly successful, incredibly courageous, incredibly strategic. They were wise in so many ways. They were brave in what they had to do. And they succeeded in a mission that they went to go and accomplish. Everything was successful about this moment. But when it comes to David, here's what David was teaching them and showing us. He paused it out, but the key is this, before the Lord. So you know what he did? This water was not just water. This water became an offering. It became a drink offering. It became an act of worship. Because here's what David is saying. He's saying our success cannot be because of our smarts and our strategy and our capability. Our success comes because of the Lord. And so we will turn all of this back to God as an act of worship. So here's the simple thing. When you and I find ourselves in a place of success, not just do we come back and say, thank you, Lord. We live a life of devotion. We live like we have been singing today. It is all about you. Lord, it's all about you. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and I live a life of constant daily devotion. So whether I have criticism or whether I have the compliments of other people, whether I am status quo or succeeding, I live a life of worship. Because in this, I am saying and recognizing that all my success all my greatness, all my good can only come about because God has given me the gifts. God has strengthened me. God has opened the door. God has made the way. It would have been impossible for three guys to have success over that army if not for the Lord. And the danger is when we start to think that my success was because I am good, that I have smart, that I have figured it out. And so the heart of this entire story of David is told to us in this theme verse that I think is about David's life. 1 Samuel 18 verse 14. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. And so that's my invitation to you and me. That if God is going to prepare us and get us ready to be launched, then even our success, we need to say, Lord, I want to live not receiving the glory to myself, but I will be quick to pour it out as an offering to you. I will live. And, and, and you know what? Sometimes Christians, we do this, okay? You know, when something good happens and somebody says, oh, well done, you say, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you know, oh, glory to God. But actually, we still feel, wow, okay, like, very good. Like. And so this act is an act of daily repentance, daily offering, daily coming and recognizing absolutely because the antidote to pride is humility. And what is humility? Humility is not to think of your, uh, less of yourself. Humility is to think less of yourself. Eh? Did I say correct? No. Samula, humility is not to think less of yourself. It's to think of yourself less. Correct. So that's the way we need to think of humility. It's not that we are, you know, because, you know, some of you might say, actually, you know, I, I don't care about fame. Like, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. But what we do is we always judge other people. We're still thinking about that. We're thinking about how come they get it and we don't. How come they are successful and we don't. We're still thinking about ourselves. So at the end of the day, it's really saying this. It really is all about God. If there's any good, if there's any success, then I live with a full reality. It's because he has gifted me. You know, if you do well in math and you get a great grade at, uh, in math, it's because he's gifted you. If you do well in English and you have a capacity to speak, it's because he's gifted you. If you have an ability to look at numbers and create wealth and all that, it's because he's gifted you. If you know how to relate to people, you know how to get people on board and to, you know, invite people to coalitions, it's because he's gifted you. And if you and I just live with an absolute awareness that anything that we get to do that produces fruit is because of the Lord, then whenever we receive whatever success, then we can continue to live with the right right heart attitude. So the big question is this, right, as we wrap this whole thing up, 
what's the purpose of success? Because we all are chasing after it. We all want it. We all want the more. We all want a greater platform. We all want a bit more power. We all want a bit more influence. But why success? Why would God give us success? David's son writes a psalm. David's, well, one of his sons is Solomon. And King Solomon writes a psalm that's very telling. And if we don't understand the situation of it, when you read it, you can think there's something wrong with Solomon. Because here's really what Solomon says, and it's in, verse, uh, in Psalms 72. I'm just going to give us a, a couple of the things that, uh, that Solomon is praying. So he prays this. He says, endow the king, that means make me more, uh, filled more with your justice. So this entire psalm is about him praying for God give me more, make me great. That's the prayer. So if you ever have a prayer that says, Lord, make me great, it's not a bad prayer. In fact, it's a good prayer. You know, if you've never prayed it, I invite you to pray, God, make me great. Make me more influential. God, give me a greater opportunity to succeed. So he says, God, uh, endow the king with your justice. Uh, he continues in it. He says, may he, the king, uh, rule from sea to sea, meaning I want to be in charge of all of this, right? And then he says this, may the desert tribes bow before him uh, and his enemies lick the dust. He's saying, God, make the enemies bow before me. That's his prayer, right? And that's what he's saying. Uh, may all the kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. When you read this psalm, you might think Solomon's lost the plot. What's wrong with him? Why is he so full of pride? Why is he praying this kind of prayer? But in the heart of the psalm, it gives us the key of why he prays this prayer. He goes on and he says this, For he, the king, will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. Why do we pray and desire to be successful? For one reason. Success is given for service. We pray for success so that we can serve other people. We desire abundance so that we can give more. We desire a greater platform so that we can uh, lift others up. We desire power so that we can share power with other people. We desire authority so that we can give authority away. Success is for service. And if we can just remember this today, that when we walk out of this uh, place, when you uh, log off uh, online, that you and I will say this, God, I do desire success. And I recognize that even in the blessing, there is the testing. But I'm going to invite you, Lord, to show me and let me live from now with a heart of service to those around me. With whatever I have, whatever little margin I have, it is for the service of others. If I have a little bit of authority, how can I invite somebody else in my team to share that authority? If I have a little bit of a clout in a, in a group, how can I leverage that so that I can raise other people up? If you're in a, in a, in a life group or in a, in a ministry team or in a school group or in an army group or in that work environment and, and you, you have the popularity uh, position, people look to you, people ask you things. Don't just be grateful for the popularity. Think of how can I raise other people? How can I look for those on the margins and invite them in and welcome them into a community? We are all the story of someone else using their power, their authority, and investing it into us. We are all the story of somebody else's success that causes us to be lifted up. And ultimately, it's this. Because of the success of Jesus on the cross, we have life, life more abundantly. And so what Jesus has done in his life was to share it all. May we be a people who say, Lord, make me successful so that I can serve more. I can serve better for your sake and to your glory that I truly would be ready to be launched. I'd like to pray for all of us and I'm going to invite Elder Charles to come and uh, take us to a time of communion uh, after that. But let me just pray for us. Father God, I, I thank you that you give us in your word so much hope, so much guidance, but Lord, we know that it's not just guidance and principle. Lord, you give us your spirit. And so we want to be as David was, Lord. Men and women who will recognize that we are successful because the Lord is with us. And so, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit, your Holy Presence to come and be in us and guide us and direct us. 
And Lord, we confess that our hearts so easily can take the glory, that our ego can be inflated by the praises and the success that we achieve. Lord, today and from here on, we just live with the absolute knowledge that we can because you have given. And whatever we have gained from others, we pour out to serve and we pour out to worship you. For we honor you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.